morning and welcome to St. Thomas. A reading from Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Friends in Christ, we come together to meet with God and to take our part in the building up of his church. We will lift up our hearts in thanks and praise, hear from God's holy word and pray for this world and for ourselves. Today we begin a new sermon series that Joshua has put together called The Isms. It will help us critically examine various aspects of our culture so that we are not, as Paul puts it in that reading from Romans 12, the unthinkingly conformed to the pattern of this world, but rather be transformed. There are many isms in our world. Which ones spring to mind? Socialism, capitalism, feminism, sexism, racism, hedonism, fundamentalism. We could go on. Let's see which ones Joshua has chosen and which one he'll begin our sermon series with this morning. Well, as we begin a new sermon series, have you also noticed the signs of new beginnings and new growth all around you? As the Song of Songs puts it, see, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come, the cooing of doves is heard in our land, the fig tree forms its early fruit, the blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Spring is the season of hope and promise. It may have extra significance for us this year as we long for an end to restrictions and the possibility of meeting together again with friends and family and as a church. A sleeping world emerges to new possibilities, weakening winter's icy grip and birdsong and bleating lamb announce to all the promise that in due season creation bursts into life. And while leaves that fell in winter lie upon the ground, soon to feed the earth in nature's wondrous cycle of death and rebirth, within the tree is the stirring of new growth. Let's pray. For the cycle of life, which brings death and rebirth, we rejoice in the promise of spring. The lengthening days and sunlight's warmth upon the soil we rejoice in the promise of spring. For a snowdrop's beauty reflecting its creator's artistry, we rejoice in the promise of spring. For newborn lambs, their joy and exuberance, we rejoice in the promise of spring. For all of creation and the majesty of its creator, we rejoice in the promise of spring. Let's sing to rejoice and praise God now.
Hello, hello, another week of lockdown, another week of stream service, and another week of updates at St. Tom's in my room. Let's kick things off with some good news. If you're worried about what to do over the school holidays, St. Tom's has you covered. We're calling this the Holiday Boredom Busters. It's a lot of fun for all ages, not just kids, not just teenagers, but for everybody. We've got things ranging from cooking classes, science experiments, creative writing, crafternoon, Pilates, everything in between. If you're excited, keep your eyes open for your email inbox. We'll be emailing you more information as they become available. Next, our friends over at Scripture Union are also organizing another holidays activity, this time for years 7 to 12. They're calling this a Make a Difference Camp or Mad Camps. Mad Camps empower young people to develop a personal, local, and global vision for making a difference. It'll be packed full of awesome activities, new friends, and tons of fun. Obviously, this will be online. It is $25 per person. Registration will be in your email inbox and also on Facebook. If you or your young people are interested, do check them out. Scripture Union Mad Camps. If you are interested in Bush Church Aid, which is one of our mission partners, they're organizing a spring lunch. Details are on your screen right now. Obviously, once again, this will be online over Zoom. Details are on your screen. If you're interested, you can hear from Topher Halliburton, who has a ministry in Alice Springs. This is very, very exciting. Do not miss it if this is what you're into. Next, I have a message that I would like to read out from a lovely Bishop Paul. Myanmar is heading into civil war. I am coordinating a diocesan prayer meeting on Zoom Sunday, 19th of September, 5.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. Please pass this on to your congregants. Any are welcome. Please keep your eyes peeled once again for your email inbox. The information will be sent out to you later this week. Next, you have the opportunity to represent St. Tom's on the world stage. Not really. St. Tom's is looking for an alternate synod representative for this year. This representative will most likely not be called upon to attend the online synod. They're simply an alternative if one out of three synod reps cannot make it. Look out for John's email this week if you are potentially interested. Finally, if you volunteer with us at St. Tom's and you work closely with children or other vulnerable people, please keep in mind that you need to get your ministry clearance by the end of this month. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check your email inbox. There will probably be one, two, maybe even three chase-up emails from me. Please do get that sorted by the end of this month or I'm going to bug you. That's it for me this week. Have a great rest of your Sunday. From the sky above to the deepest sea, God is everywhere and you're never too small to be loved by God. You'll never be on his care. If you stub your toe when you get out of bed And you slip in the shower and you knock your head If you miss your brekkie and your bike tires flat If the dog eats your lunch and you step on the cat Remember the Lord, oh Remember that He is in control Remember the Lord, oh He's watching His children He cares, oh Remember the Lord, oh, oh If you get to school about a half hour late And the principal meets you at the gate if you can't remember one plus two And you busted for something that you didn't do Remember the Lord, oh Remember that He is in control Remember the Lord, oh He's watching His children He cares, oh Remember 
name of the Lord. Oh, oh. If your dad is crusty and your mum's in a flap, and you spill the custard in your sister's lap If you're sent to bed and you don't know why And you can't get to sleep and you just want to cry <laughs> Remember the Lord, oh Remember that He is in control Remember the Lord, oh He's watching His children He cares, oh Remember the Lord, oh Well, if you're hitting the skids and you're up the creek If you're down and out and things look bleak If you're in the pits and you're out for a duck If you're long in the tooth and short of a buck Remember the Lord, oh, remember that He is in control. Remember the Lord, oh, He's watching His children, He cares, oh, remember the Lord, oh, oh. Good day, St. Tom's. This week in Sunday Club and on into Term 4, we're going to start to learn more about Jesus, his life, and all the different people that he met. We may need some helpers to be on board to help with this mission. I have some job descriptions here. Would it be you? We may need someone who loves to read the Bible. That's me! And need someone who can help to draw a big picture. That's me. And we need someone who's willing to do the craft. That's me. And to help tidy up. And we need someone who would like to help online game, quiz, Kahoot. That's so me. me, Mario. And we need someone who really loves God, who's willing to come to Sunday school to help. That's, That's me. me. Wow, how wonderful. Then we need a main character for this program. Here's the description. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Who? What? Why? Huh? That's me, Jesus said. This week in Sunday Club, we will begin to look at who Jesus is and how Jesus is at the center of God's big story. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 to 2, Isaiah writes that God anointed him to help others and tell them about the Lord. And from the gospel, we can learn that Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Would you like to help to tell others more about our Lord Jesus? I know you will, and you can. As we have heard, especially recently in the story of Joshua, how God is faithful and he fulfills all his promises. Jesus is very much part of this. And in today's Sunday Club, we will have the running thread session. It helps us to see that the Bible isn't just a series of separate stories. It's God's big story. 
And Jesus is the center of that story. And we're going to learn more about him so that we can tell the others about our Lord Jesus and his kingdom. Let us pray. Most loving Father, thank you. Thank you for such a beautiful day. Thanks that we can still worship you all together. We lift our wonderful Sunday club to you. May you help us to learn more about your son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you. May you guide us to love you, to love each other, to proclaim the good news of your kingdom. Father, praise and glory be to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, good morning to all of you St Thomases. My name's Joshua. I'm the Assistant Minister uh, at St Thomases, and uh, it's my pleasure to be able to bring this sermon to you today. This week we begin a new series. Now this series is topical rather than working through a book or a passage of the Bible as we might normally do. And that topic is essentially culture. More specifically, it's thinking through a few aspects of our culture, our cultural landscape that we might not notice or we might not think about normally, or maybe that we do notice, but we wanna pay attention to in the light of the gospel. And I've called all of these isms, called the series isms. That suffix ism means taking side with, or in imitation of, or ideology. We most commonly use it by tacking it onto the ends uh, of, of words, of ideas that take on grand narratives of their own. So over the next few weeks, we are looking at secularism, nihilism, materialism, politicism, and we begin today with ageism. Each of these things are in the air. They are part of the world that we live in and part of the world that we are shaped by. They aren't um, as in the news as many other isms, like maybe tribalism or feminism or sexism or racism or nationalism or fundamentalism. But for that reason, they seem to exert over us an even greater pressure. If we don't pay attention to the world that we live in, then we take on more of its ideas unconsciously. If we aren't aware of our cultural influences, we trade on its ideas and its terms less critically. If we aren't aware of where we sit, it is very hard to let ourselves be conformed to Christ and not to the world. So the motivation for this series then is a central point of Christian discipleship, Romans 12, verse one and two. I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is then a series about liberation. Christians have the hard job, but also the privilege of having to think about life instead of taking on culture and our historical moment without question. So one last caveat before we begin on ageism. Culture isn't bad. That's not what this is about. Our culture isn't bad just because we're Christian and our culture isn't. The aim of Christianity is not to conquer culture, not to make our culture Christian. In this series, all we're saying is it's worth knowing what we are pressured by what we are all surrounded by and what the gospel says to the assumptions that we all live in. So what we can talk about now is how we are culturally pressured to assume ageism, culturally pressured to be ageist. But let's begin with scripture. Stand up in the presence of the aged. Show respect for the elderly and revere your God. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19. 32. We're reading today from 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 6, through to chapter 5, and verse 2. 
If you put these instructions before the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with profane myths and old wives' tales. Train yourself in godliness. For while physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for both the present life and for the life to come. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and struggle because we have our hope set on the living God who is the saviour of all people, especially of those who believe. These are the things you must insist on and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhorting, to teaching. Do not neglect do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. Put these things into practice. Devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Continue in these things, for in doing this you will save both yourself and your hearers. Do not speak harshly to an older man, but speak to him as a father, to younger men as brothers, to older women as mothers, to younger women as sisters, with absolute purity. This is the word of the Lord. Recently, the World Health Organization put out a global report on ageism. And they put the definition like this. Ageism refers to the stereotypes, how we think, prejudice, how we feel, and discrimination, how we act, directed towards people on the basis of their age. Now, there's lots of academic literature that defines ageism rather like this. Ageism is the systematic stereotyping and discrimination against people because they are old. But it is possible to be ageist to younger people to stereotype, be prejudiced, and discriminate people on the basis of their young or younger age. Older people might be stereotyped as close-minded. Younger people might be stereotyped as reckless. Some may feel a prejudice towards older people as incompetent. Someone may feel prejudice to younger people as unreliable. Older people may experience discrimination in employment opportunities. Younger people may experience discrimination in exclusion from decision-making bodies in public life. It can go upwards or downwards and from wherever, wherever you are to any other age group. So what does it look like in our Australian cultural, cultural experience? How does this play out in Australian life so that it's affecting us and threatens to deform our discipleship? Well, let me highlight today three examples. One, the idolatry of youth. Two, housing and climate, and three, aged care, residential aged care. So firstly, the most obvious point of cultural pressure on us to assume ageism is the idolatry of youth. This has been part of Western society for many, many decades now. It's been with humanity for far, far longer. But this myth is that young equals beautiful and desirable, and on the other side of that, not young equals undesirable. It's the myth in all the beauty products uh, that you see advertised. It's the selling point of basically everything. Where sex used to sell, now youth sells. In our moment, this very well-known idea has taken on new forms. So cosmetic surgery is at its highest ever peak. I remember when cosmetic surgery was about taking things out. And now, weirdly enough, it's about putting things in and on parts of the body that only a few years ago were the very places people were desperate to take things out of fashion. In the third century, a Christian leader named Tertullian said, the harder we work to conceal our age, the more we reveal it. And that remains true. 
We are pressured to not age. We are pressured to assume that youth is the peak of life and beauty is the most important thing about us. The highest achievement we can have, the best protection from loneliness and the greatest insurance against irrelevancy. This idolatry, this worship of youth, pressures us to ignore anyone who isn't young and think about ourselves in conformity to youth. For ageism, it fosters a belief in us that older people are not as important, their company and friendship not as desirable, their input not as significant. But it also pressures young people to not grow up and to have to achieve their most and to achieve as much as they possibly can in only one moment of life. If we are pressured by this cultural assumption, then this verse comes to seem to us sentimental at best. Proverbs 16, 31. Grey hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. But God is not speaking sentimentally here. Example two. Housing and climate. I bring this up because ageism here is kind of finds itself coupled with and really fueled by tribalism. This is years old now, but for a while it was the staple routine of comedians, young comedians, to do a comedy bit on housing. Because in the US, in Canada, New Zealand, Britain, Australia, housing is just so unaffordable, at least in comparison to 40 or 50 years ago. So comedians would mock a person who bought a house in the 1970s and say, I paid 11 raspberries for it. And a very cynical and bitter frustration sort of fermented there into a resentment of whoever was able to buy a house in 1970, 1980 with their 11 raspberries. And what did homeowners retort to young people with? Do you remember this? Well, if you didn't buy avocado on toast every day, you could have a house too. But you couple that with this similar division of concern between two age groups, the interest and passion about the entire array of ecological problems this world is facing. This is concentrated in climate change, but it's really the whole package. In 2019, there was a strike of school students around Australia, protesting the inaction of government bodies on climate change issues. But it didn't really play out in Australian culture as a contest between students and government. Instead, it played out as a battle between young people and the baby boomer generation. Now, there's lots of reasons for that. But cheapest of them, I think, is because it was the baby boomer generation that was seen to sit in government. It was people in the baby boomer generation that appeared in that kind of social commentary that's pretending to be news saying that these kids should be ashamed and they were reckless. It was turned into Greta versus Scotty. And that's why these two issues, housing and climate, got tied together. Because baby boomers were thought to own the houses and younger people felt shut out of housing. Because young people were passionately interested in acting on climate change and because it was perceived that baby boomers were telling them to stay in school. And that whole scenario bred ageism. Young people were treated as if they weren't citizens, at times as if they weren't even people. They were denied a set of rights clearly granted to adults, to protest, to be heard, to be seen as responsible agents looking to their futures, interested in society. And older people were in turn all lumped together with a particular kind of conservative. And the retort just became, OK Boomer, an incredibly dismissive, rude and utterly ageist jibe. And that all meant that nobody saw or believed this. The glory of youths is their strength, but the beauty of the aged is their grey hair. Proverbs twenty twenty nine. That seems sentimental at best to us, because to us, Beauty is youth and we have almost no categories of honour for any other period of life after that. But God is not speaking sentimentally. Example three, residential aged care. 
In Australia, aged care is a massive industry, not only because we have an aging population and not only because it's so incredibly expensive, but because this is our way of dealing with the frailty that comes at the end of life. And I don't mean that to condemn anyone. It's a system that we are all pressured and expected to become part of as our parents and grandparents and chronically ill family age or get sicker. Our economy just doesn't allow us to care for people at home. And as people live longer and live longer with serious health conditions like the various kinds of dementia, then we're simply not prepared for this. But the thing about culture is that it can always be different. Residential aged care could be organised so many different ways. The Royal Commission report into aged care found so many problems that they had and were facing, deeply ingrained problems. These were access to care, substandard care, abuse, high expectations and low training of staff, poor social connections that were left unmanaged or simply ignored by providers, and a swathe of scenarios that contributed to the daily feeling of indignity amongst our oldest citizens. The Royal Commission report had this to say. Over the last several decades, successive Australian governments have brought a level of ambivalence, timidity and detachment to their approach to aged care. And we have to wonder if the Australian government was really just reflecting social attitudes more broadly in dealing with aged care. One consequence of this system and this pressure and this organisation of residential aged care is that we actually all lose hope. All of us. One survey in Australia showed that rates of depression in life are actually at their lowest as people age into that last age bracket. But this is not the case if they're in residential aged care, in which case rates of depression massively skyrocket. So the frailty of later life is intensified rather than supported. And aged care places are treated in our cultural imagination with fear because we don't want to see our incapacity to deal with aging and the inevitable fact that it will happen to us. We all lose hope then because we develop an imagination for age that it is the worst part of life. And in some places in Australia, in residential aged care, it's made that way. Ours is not a situation where this vision of God's community in Israel would em uh, embody a society of perfect justice and peace is realised. You shall rise before the age, aged and defer to the old, and you shall fear your God, I am the Lord. Leviticus 19.32 this whole dynamic feeds ageism. It feeds a cultural assumption that the oldest people in our society are not people, at least not like the rest of us. So youth was idolised and every sign of distance from youth was shunned. Young people were not respected and ages were divided and no respect was given. Long age was shut away and our communities grew hopeless and fearful. Christians can look at these facts of our cultural landscape and acknowledge that we are pressured towards certain attitudes by them. But we also, as Christians, acknowledge a deeper reality. We are ageist upwards and downwards, most of all because of something deeper, something more existential, because we fear death. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 15 says that Jesus frees those who all their lives were held in slavery by fear of death. Why do we fear death? Because it is awful. Even Christians, especially Christians, say that. But if we believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, why would we believe that death is so awful? Well, it's because we are not really meant to die. We are not made for death. Scott Harrow, he teaches at Ridley, he says this in his book, God of All Comfort. The process of death and dying is also a gross horror, perhaps the definitive gross horror. It ends the functional and most relational aspects of being made in the image of God. It is wholly incompatible and opposed to the purposes of life for which God created us. At death, the body is separated from the soul, rending apart the image of God 
and threatening God's purposes for the universe. This fear and repulsion of death make us do silly things. My favourite learning in preparing for this sermon was uh, a survey of studies by Lauren Popham. Her research showed a correlation between ageism in young adults and adverse risk-taking. It's too long to spell out the detail, but she collected data and literature which confirmed the relationship between negative attitudes in young adults towards older people and their risk-taking behaviours in reckless driving, casual unprotected sex and drug and alcohol use. And this data all fit with a more philosophical theory that young people were seeking to distance themselves from this future, older and finite, dying self by death-defying activities. And here's where we begin to look at the Bible and see nuance. There's this beautiful poem in Ecclesiastes 12 about ageing. And it includes descriptions of ageing which show it to be wearisome and hard, even unpleasant. But that is only so because we die. But imagine a world where we age, but ageing is not deterioration towards death. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul speaks of the sufferings of life and the hardship of ministry. But he concludes, so we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away our inner nature is being renewed day by day. We must live our discipleship with a recognition that dying is awful, but ageing has gifts and goods and opportunities and essential experiences towards wholeness. In other words, we need ageing to become what we are called to be, mature disciples. Death is the intruder, ageing is not. We need to note a passage that shows us that we need all the ages for a church of mature disciples. That shows us that every age has gifts for the others. And this is what Paul encourages upon Timothy. In our reading from 1 Timothy today, we get a better vision for Christian life in community than our culture's assumptions and pressures about ageism. Timothy is himself a young person, but he is indebted to older people in his life. Uh, firstly, to his mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice, 1 Timothy 2.15. But secondly, to Paul himself. Paul acts as a mentor, a guide, a father in the faith to Timothy. Paul modelled his ministry and character throughout the missionary journeys that they shared together. And these letters direct Timothy when Paul is far away. Paul relied, in turn, on Timothy in his older age, 2 Timothy 4.13. Thirdly, Timothy is indebted to and reliant on the elders who commissioned him as a leader of this church, as we see in verse 14. Now, those relationships show us that our church needs people with experience and practice and wisdom to counsel and teach those who are younger. But notice that this is not just merely for the church's continuation after these people, it is for their today. Timothy is really made the leader of this church in his youth. So as much as Timothy and the church as a whole rely on the ability of older people to counsel and teach, real leadership is given in the present to a younger person. That is an interdependence between generations. Now, the point is not that vicars or curates must be young, but that every age has gifts for the others. So, Timothy relies on those older than him, and the church is also reliant on Timothy as a younger person. They're not to look down on his youth. His inexperience or experience in years is not the qualifying factor for his ministry. It is a collection of other things which are not about age. It is firstly, uh, the first of these qualifiers, is Timothy's character. Verses 7 to 8, godliness and a training in godliness. There's no stereotype here about young people being reckless or immature. There is a clear expectation of... <sighs> the first of these qualifiers is Timothy's character. Verses 7 to 8, godliness and a training in godliness. 
There's no stereotype here about young people being reckless or immature. There is a clear expectation of sincere and enduring godliness in his life. It is, secondly, Timothy's giftings given by God, verse 14. There's a real belief here that God gifts to all for the common good and that God's spirit has been poured out on young and old, as the prophet Joel said, Joel 2, 28. And the third qualifier is Timothy's progress. And this is where youth can really be seen as a gift that the church needs. Timothy's growth is a gift and a qualification to minister to the church. Now, we know that Paul elsewhere says that uh, new converts cannot be leaders. Um, you can't have unformed converts come into positions of leadership. There is a certain level of maturity necessary, but it is the development and the growth of Timothy as a Christian and as a leader, which is, is in this instance important. It is not just that people older than Timothy can help him grow, but that Timothy's growth is a gift everyone else needs. The church needs to rely on younger people's experience of growing in order to pay attention to how to keep growing. And younger people need to pay attention to what we are to grow into through the relationships and modelling by mature and seasoned disciples. In today's setting, the church gets really excited about young leaders, I think. That's not the reason he is made a leader here. And remember that in some sense, he still shares leadership in whatever arrangement it is with the elders mentioned in verse 14 and elsewhere in the letter. It's because of Timothy's character, gifts and progress that he's qualified for leadership. And chapter 5 verses 1 to 2 rounds us out with saying that leadership is not also the position of dominance. Age distinctions are not eradicated, they are transformed in God's family, so that those older than us deserve the respect of parents and those younger as if they were siblings that we are here to support. What this all tells us is that every age has gifts for the others. How much more compassion would each of us have if we knew, in a real sense knew, the challenges of being a teenager right now, or the challenges of being in that stage in life in the years before you needed home care or residential care. And compassion is only one gift to be found. You cannot be at the best part of life for everything. You can be at your most adventurous part of life at nine years old, but you aren't also at your most disciplined. You can be at the best part of patience of your life at age 48, but you aren't also at your most innocent. You can be at the best part of life to give counsel at 72, but you aren't also at your most daring. So if you want to not be shaped by our culture and avoid growing up ageist, then spend time with people who aren't your age. If you still have grandparents, talk to them. If you don't know what your parents were doing at the age that you are now, ask them. If you have grandchildren, don't give up on being a big part of their lives and make every prayer and effort to make that part modelling the faith of Jesus. Learn from the concerns of young people about the future. Have an older mentor in your own discipleship. Now, it's worth saying that in our church, you need to respect young people by practising safe ministry relationships. So cornering a young person to force them to explain Roblox to you is not the best start but learning young people's names is. It's worth saying lots of things, but this is kind of long already. So in finishing, know that the Bible paints us a picture where ageing is not the problem. Dying is the curse. In God's good world, ageing meant only having grown and formed the longest into who we are now. Every age has gifts for other ages. Older people need babies and toddlers. Toddlers need teenagers. Teenagers need people whose kids have just left home. And millennials need baby boomers. And in the church, we can show Australian society that the world works under God's care when each age gifts the others with its treasures. Treasures of experience, 
treasures of the enthusiasm and passion of youth unjaded by experience, treasures of innocence, treasures of struggle, treasures of when we are at the best part of life for one experience, when someone else is at the best part of life for a different one. So let us pray. Our Lord God, we give you thanks that you have gifted us by your Holy Spirit, called us to grow all our lives into uh, people who are more and more like Jesus all the way through. We pray that you would knit us together in bonds of fellowship in the unity of your Holy Spirit, that we would come to depend on each other deeply and that we might come to listen to one another patiently and lovingly. We pray that you would form us together into a people who embody what it is to be called your own and to grow up into the image of Christ. Bless us, we pray. Amen. So Timothy relies on those older than him, and the church is also reliant on Timothy as a younger person. They are not to look down on his youth. His inexperience or experience in years is, for goodness sake, shut up!
come to the time where we affirm our faith together. We believe in one God who made and loves all that is. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was born, lived, died and rose again and is coming to call all to account. We believe in the Holy Spirit who calls, equips and sends out God's people and brings all things to their true end. This is our faith, the faith of the church. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Come now to a time of confession. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God, though we have rebelled and wandered far off. Let us then ask for mercy, confessing our sins in penitence and faith, saying together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are heartily sorry and repent of all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Well, we come to the end of our service. If you would like to pray with someone after the service, uh, the phone numbers of people you can call will be on the email that you've received. Or you might also like to join one of the morning tea Zoom gatherings. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, feeding us with your word and encouraging us in our meeting together. Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.